Today, we're going to explore From Farms to Incubators, a unique multimedia platform to uplift the efforts of women and women of color and the agri-food tech field. Our guest today is Amy Wu, the creator and content director for From Farms to Incubators. She's an award-winning writer and the visionary behind the documentary and book highlighting women leaders in food, farming, and farm tech. Welcome to the Leading Voices in Food podcast. I'm Norbert Wilson, a professor of public policy at Duke University and director of the World Food Policy Center. Amy, it is a delight to talk to you again. Thank you, Norbert, so much for that introduction. Thank you so much for having me today. It's great being here. I have a great set of questions for you. So the first thing, could you just tell our listeners a little bit more about From Farms to Incubators? Sure. Happy to. From Farms to Incubators is a special initiative and project that tells the stories of women in this fast-growing field known as ag tech, sometimes interchangeably used as agri-food tech as well. The mission of it is really to get more women involved in ag tech through storytelling through resources, and also through education and training. I also would describe it as a multimedia content platform. I actually came to this as a journalist and as a storyteller that uses storytelling to amplify the voices of women leaders and entrepreneurs in this field. It's also a documentary and a book and also a website where we archive their stories and their biographies as well. Thanks for that overview. And You just talked about the book and the documentary from Farms to Incubators, Women Innovators Revolutionizing How Our Food Has Grown, which uses storytelling to highlight women innovators and how women innovators in the agri-food tech are doing their best. But there's also a movement in the community and, and this multimedia platform. Why did you expand from the book and documentary into this larger network? That's a really good question. Briefly, as some context, I kind of fell into this project. It was a bit of serendipity. I was a reporter in Salinas, California, which is the vegetable salad bowl of the world. Ag is a huge industry, a $10 billion industry. And I was covering government and agriculture. And I observed that there were not a lot of women at the helm of the table, whether it be at farms or also in this growing field of ag tech as well. So Actually, it started off as a documentary. I got a grant from the International Center for Journalists, and then ultimately I got another grant from the International Media Women's Foundation to do a short documentary to profile three women who are entrepreneurs in ag tech. It was great. It was at the time in 2016, which now was ages ago, I guess. It was really hard to find women in ag, in this field of ag tech, women creating the innovations to tackle some of the biggest challenges that farmers are facing, especially under climate change. So it could have ended there because the documentary turned out to be very, very well received. It screened at hundreds of places and I would have panels and discussions and the women would look at each other like, my gosh, I didn't know there were other women doing this too. Can you connect us? We'd love to convene further. And then educators, community leaders, says, Investors just didn't know they existed as well. So what happened was the stories kind of multiplied and multiplied as the more that I collected them. And then I decided to put it into a book profiling about 30 women in this growing field. And to answer your question, Norbert, why is it continuing is that I saw a real need for women to have a community, women in agriculture and innovation and the food systems to have a community to connect with one another to potentially build friendship, build collaboration, build partnership, creating a collective vision sometimes and a place for them. I didn't plan on it. So I guess the storytelling connects them. We've also have resources like a database that connects them. And the goal is really so that they can have a community where they can build more. They can either build out their own startups. They can build their careers, build their professions. And then it kind of grew more legs. (laughs) Now we're also extending into the area of education and training to try to get younger women, young people, youth to see that agriculture, hey, may not be traditionally sexy. I mean, tractors and overalls is still what a lot of people think about it. 
But there are so many other opportunities in the food system for young people as well, especially since we all have to eat. So how are farmers going to be producing the food for 10 billion people in 2050, right? Who's going to produce the food? How are we going to do it, especially under the auspices of climate change? The weather's getting crazier and crazier. That's sort of why it it has expanded from the stories all the way to what it is today. This is a great story. And I would love to hear a little bit more about some of the women and their innovations. And if I may, I would like for you to actually even explain a little bit about what you mean by the ag food tech or agri food tech as you're talking about these women. Broadly defined is any kind of innovation that makes it easier, frankly, for farmers to do their work, to grow more efficiently and to also increase their yields. I can give some examples of what innovation is. Blockchain addresses food safety, really. It traces everything from the seed to all the way on the shelf, right? So if there's any safety issues, it's used to trace back where did that seed come from? Where was it grown? What field was it in? And that really helps everybody in the food systems a lot more, right? We have sensors connected with drones. I forgot to mention robotics as well, which is a fast growing area of ag tech. So everything from self-driving tractors to laser scarecrows to another level of robots that are picking specific kinds of fruits and vegetables that's tackling labor challenges. So I don't foresee that ag tech necessarily is a replacement, by the way, of people. It's actually offering more opportunities because we need people who are very knowledgeable of that kind of innovation. And then you also asked a bit about the stories of the women in ag tech, for example, in the film, in the book and so forth. Soil sampling is a fast growing area of ag tech. So there's a story that I have in the book and also in the movie of two young women who are Stanford PhD graduates who created a soil testing kit that makes it easy for farmers to just test their soil for diseases, for pests. And soil testing is actually traditionally, you know, very, very expensive for most farmers, actually. Not easy for farmers to get access to it and to get the data. But the soil testing kit that they created makes it a lot easier for farmers, small farmers even, to access it. And why is that important is because the more knowledge, the more data that and analytics that farmers can get, the more that they can make smart decisions about how much to fertilize, how much to irrigate. <laughs> and that connects with the yield and their success. You know, another company that I can think about, another amazing woman, I just like her story, the story of ag tools and the story of Martha Montoya, who was actually a, an award-winning cartoonist. And she doesn't come from agriculture at all. And that's actually something that I want to highlight is a lot of these women are not farmers and don't come from agriculture. But she was a award-winning cartoonist, I believe also a librarian. And she fell into the food industry, actually, and saw a need for having more data, offering more data and analytics to farmers. So she created a system a little bit like a Bloomberg for farmers where they can get real-time data immediately on their phones, on their watches, so that they can get second-by-second data to make decisions on a specific crop. There's a couple of the stories that are in the book, but really what I want to highlight is that all of the innovation that they are creating addresses some of the biggest challenges that farmers are facing, whether it be labor issues, lack of water, Some areas of our country are becoming more wet. Others are becoming more dry. Drones that are actually doing the irrigation now or drones taking photos to give more data to farmers as well on what does their land look like. You know, it could also be human resources related as well to manage staff. So mobile apps to manage staff on cattle farms. I mean, how big are the cattle farms sometimes? you know, 50,000 acres. So um, it's really to save money and to create efficiency for farmers. Yeah. And if farmers are able to do their work more efficiently, they're able to generate greater profits, but it also allows for food prices not to rise. So this has really 
big implications. So thank you for sharing those stories. And I love hearing about some of the individuals. But here's the question. I mean, why focus on women? What's important about what women contribute to this? And and also, why are you also considering race as an important lens in this sector? Well, I would say, why not women? (laughs) Because women have already been contributing to the global food system, whether in the production end or the decision makers at the head of the dinner table for thousands upon thousands of years, arguably. So what I discovered is that their stories, their contributions, existing contributions were not being celebrated and were not being amplified. And I actually discovered that a lot of the women that I connected with were a bit shy about even telling their story and sharing it, like kind of like, what is my contribution? And I'm like, well, why aren't you sharing your story more? So the goal of it really is to document and celebrate their contributions, but also to inspire, as I said, young women, next generation, all of us have daughters, nieces, granddaughters, you know, and then future generations to consider opportunities in a field where we need people. We need people who are smart and you don't have to be from a generation of farmers. You could be in science, engineering, technology, and math. You could just be passionate about it and you could be in the field. So that's the first aspect of it. In terms of the lens of gender and race, there are not enough women in terms of just the startups in ag tech. Right now, only 2% of the billions of dollars being invested in ag tech startups, only 2% are going into women-led companies. It is very, very little. It is a problem that is deep-rooted. And it starts with funding. One problem is that where is the funding coming from? Venture capitalists, traditional avenues of funding where it is traditionally male dominated. So there are many studies that show that investors will invest in companies where they connect with those who are leading the companies, right? So similar gender, similar background, similar stories. So We're really looking to have a paradigm shift and move the needle of sorts and say that if there are more investors, there are more board members who are from a diversity background, then there will be more funding for women and those who are traditionally not leading agriculture, not in the leadership positions, not in the decision-making roles, right? So there is a problem. There is a what is a grass ceiling, not just glass ceiling, but grass ceiling. (laughs) Okay. I hear you. I hear you. Now, this is really fascinating. I know from colleagues who are in agriculture that there is this demand for more agricultural workers throughout the agri-food system. And if there is a demand, we're saying that our colleges that produce the potential workers aren't meeting those demands. One of the ways we can see that change is by having more women and more people of color join in. So this is a critical thing. And I would imagine also the experiences that people bring may be a critical part of coming up with new innovations. Diversity can do that. And so this is exciting that you're exploring this. I love what you're saying, Norbert. And I want to touch upon that about what you just noted is that It's also to create a pipeline, right? The education training is just so critical. And it makes me so happy to see that there are more and more programs at universities and colleges that are addressing programs in food systems, in agriculture, and also increasingly in ag tech. So whether they be courses or programs or certificates or eventually minors and majors, developing the pipeline of talent is really important in having mentors and mentees, which is something that now we're working on. Actually, this fall, we'll have launched a menteeship program for women and for young people interested in ag tech. And the first collaborator is the UC Merced in California. So thanks for bringing that up. We have a couple of young people ready at the starting gates. (laughs) Really excited. I will say, Just on a personal note, I was active in 4-H for most of my youth, and that's the way I got involved in agriculture. So touching or reaching out to folks in their youth is critical to get them excited. 
and help them to make the connections so that they can do that work further. I'm glad to hear this work. In your view, what are some of the ongoing challenges and opportunities that women face in the ag tech sector or the agri-food sector? What are some of the things you're observing? Well, continued challenges is having a a place at the table, meaning at the leadership and decision-making level. And actually, I noted earlier the access to funding and the not just the money, but the access to resources, mm-hmm. meaning could be legal, operational, just how to mm-hmm. get their startups or get their ideas out there. So one example that I'm seeing that's, again, positive is that there's a growing number of incubators and accelerators, specifically in food tech or ag tech, that is actually looking for candidates who are women or who are from underrepresented communities. So the first thing is that they have a great innovation, of course, but the next thing that the incubators and accelerators are looking for is to have a diversity of perspectives and to have representation. So Mm -hmm. seeing a lot more of that, whether it be in individual accelerators or even ones at at the university, right? Universities and colleges and the governmental level. The other challenge is access to farmers and connecting them with the farmers Mm -hmm. themselves. Because farmers Mm -hmm. are very, very busy, and that's highlighted and bolded, (laughs) increasingly just dealing with this chess game (laughs) that's very hard to play with the weather, but also with their own resources. It's expensive being a farmer, equipment, labor. So they don't often have the time, frankly, to beta test some of the innovations coming out. So how best to connect innovators with the farmers and to have them communicate with each other like this is the innovation this is how it's going to help your problem and educating Mm -hmm. the farmer and allowing them to see that this is how it's going to address the problem that i have so the two are still kind of separate and access to each other is still i would say a major challenge but right now some of the solutions are as i've noted networking at the conferences, convenings, also under the grant program, sometimes under the National Science Foundation or USDA. They are allowing more collaborative initiatives where you have educators, where you have policy, where you have the innovators, where you have the young people. So increasingly seeing more and more of those kind of projects and initiatives happen. So hopefully everybody will have a seat at the table. And that would help women out a lot in the field as well. Awesome. Thank you for sharing those. And and I love the fact that you're looking at not just identifying issues, but also trying to find ways of connecting folks to help overcome those challenges that women and and women of color are facing in, in the marketplace. And it's the connections that are really critical. I appreciate you highlighting that. So what is your ideal vision? Oh, one more thing I forgot to note is that in terms of connecting, there's also a database, a women in agri-food tech database, and I and at least four or five other women in the field have been working on for at least four or five years now. We have now at more than a thousand members. It's an open source database where you can click on a form, put your name there, and information takes a few minutes, and then you're added to this database where the women can be connected to each other as well. So that's another resource. Yeah. And I mean, even just having peer mentors, not just mentors who are above you and have like solved all the problems, but having people to go along with you as you're developing and as they are developing can be a critical part. I know as an academic, that's important for me and has been important for me. And I can imagine the same is true in this space as well. Absolutely. So I'm I'm so grateful to hear about this work. Yeah. What is your ideal vision for women in agri-food tech in the next, say, five years? And how will the digital network for from farms to incubators play a role in achieving that goal or those goals? Yeah, so my dream, it always starts, I think, in the dreaming phase (laughs) and then connecting that with also resources along the way. But if I could wave my magic wand, I would say that we would have a lot more women in leadership and thought decision-making positions in ag tech to the point where maybe we won't even need something like from farm stinking beers anymore because they'll be already equal. The stories will be out there. 
So it might be questionable as to why we have a special subgroup or network for this now. How to get to that vision, I think the three components of increasingly having more stories and the women tell their stories at public outreach, you know, it could be at conferences, it could be in their own communities, sharing their story out to the community of farmers, of local government, of schools, local schools and colleges and universities, gardening clubs. The second component is education and training, building a pipeline. So a vision that I have is actually having a campus, a virtual and also in-person campus where women, especially from women in underprivileged communities, will have the opportunity to have training and be connected with mentors and the rock stars in the ag tech and agri food tech field, where they will also be able to have a project and initiative and test it out and have something to add to their portfolio. So to have classes and people who are teaching those courses as well, ultimately, and then also to just build up a hub of resources. Like I mentioned the database, I mentioned that we'd like to extend it to as having resources where folks can easily access internships, fellowships, grantees, where they can be connected to funding if they need help with legal, HR, just all components of everything that's needed to actually have a successful organization. And it doesn't have to just be their own startup. It could be a job database of where we have larger organizations and companies that are building up their own ag innovation or food innovation center as well. Mm-hmm. So that is the vision. Oh, it's a great. big vision. It's a big dream. So we're going to have to kind of yeah. break it down into components. But I think taking it step sure. by step is the way to go, kind of like climbing Everest or doing a long distance swim. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I can see where you're trying to go in this vision. And I, I'm interested to know what, if any role, could policy play in helping advance that vision? Yeah, so what role could policy play in advancing this vision? Currently, there actually is when it comes to diversity inclusion in the ag tech field or even in agriculture, there is somewhat a lack of policy in a way, but then also with individual organizations and corporations, obviously there is the movement of diversity, inclusion, but also I think it's very much with the hiring practices with HR actually. So I think it's up to individual organizations, whether they be small, larger ones, governmental to look at their own hiring practices and to look at who are they, how are they crafting the language when they look for a job, when they look at their leadership team, are there ways to further diversify it? And when it comes to gender, ethnicities, people who come from a rural area, urban, I mean, we all come with from a diversity of perspectives and stories. So I think a lot of it will come down to hiring practices and advancing this vision. And also with the individuals who are already working at those organizations to be more thoughtful and conscious about giving those who don't have a place at the table, a place and a voice at the table, giving everybody a chance. Because we have some amazingly talented and knowledgeable people who just traditionally in agriculture don't have families and generations who come from an ag background, but they do come with so much that they could offer. So I would say that those are a couple of examples of that as well. And maybe more discussion about policy is really needed on a larger level when it comes to farmers, when it comes to government leaders, when it comes to innovation leaders as well, and when it comes to educators and schools. I think the more the merrier when it comes to bringing folks at the table to open it up for discussion on solutions. I I appreciate this. And um, in particular, this idea of not just welcoming people so that they get in the door, but also creating environments and spaces where people are actually welcomed once they're there, that it becomes a place where folks can be themselves and bring all of who they are to the work that they're doing. This is critical. Yeah, absolutely. I want to touch upon that. My own story is I don't have an agricultural background myself, but when I first landed in a place like Salinas, very much sort of an outsider because I'm not from there anyway, but also not in agriculture and then being a woman and being, you know, a Chinese American woman too, 
you know, I, I did feel that there was a challenge to kind of break into certain circles and to be welcome. Even despite my passion and enthusiasm, there was a little bit like, what is she, why, why, what? She, she doesn't know anything. But I felt like it was the people who, in the beginning, it was just a couple of people who were like, hey, this is somebody who really wants to tell the story of what we're doing. Give her a chance, you know? Having advocates, frontline advocates, made a huge difference. So that's what I'm hoping for, more frontline advocates. Amy, I got to just pick up on a personal story out of this. I did my graduate training out at UC Davis, University of California, Davis, and I worked on dairy policy, which I do not have a dairy background. And it was great to have a mentor who actually helped me, who introduced me to a number of folks and working through Extension and, and the California Department of Food and Ag folks made space for me and they understood that I was interested in this particular policy and trying to understand what it meant. And I actually got to learn so much. It was because people who just said, okay, we'll give you a try. And I, I did the best I could. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. And so creating these spaces is not hard. Um, it's not impossible. It can be done. And so I'm really appreciative of your efforts to keep furthering that story. I love that story. And indeed, Norbert's like what you said, creating the space. And even even in the beginning, just having a couple of folks just to make space. And then I think the space is going to grow from there. I uh, fully agree. I, I've got one last question for you. And, and it's, it's sort of, again, sort of related to the vision, but just also thinking long term. What impact do you hope your work will ultimately have on society? I hope that my work will actually create a bit of a shift Ultimately, I mean, that's a rather large goal, but it's not just myself. As this project has grown and extended and expanded, it's really a joint team effort. I mean, along this journey, I've met folks who are mission aligned and they also see the value in this and they believe in something similar. So whether it be that they contribute their story, whether it be that they help write the stories, whether it be that they come be a guest speaker and they share their career, and then they end up connecting with a younger person. Every person counts in, the, in making a shift. And it might take generations to completely have a paradigm shift, but I think that just moving the needle a bit is ultimately the goal, certainly. And in terms of the bigger picture of things, I'm hoping that it will continue to spark a, a discussion and ongoing conversation about the importance and the value of bringing different voices and people who traditionally were not given a space at the table when it comes to the food systems and agriculture, but who bring so much talent, so much to the table already, how we can make greater space for them as well, and how we can incorporate their talent and actually create a better food system for everybody. We all eat, and we're looking at 10 billion people in 2050. So looking at the people who are making those contributions and telling their stories and especially for those who traditionally have not had their voices told, I think is really, really important. So I just keep the fire going, I guess. Well, let it burn. I'm really happy to hear your story and all the work that you're doing. It is so exciting to learn about the innovations that you are creating and highlighting and uh, spotlighting the women who are doing this work. I think this is a great place to stop. So again, thank you, Amy. Our guest today is Amy Wu of From Farms to Incubators. If you want to learn more, go online to www.farmstoincubators.com. Amy, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Norbert, for having me. And a special thanks to Deborah Hill, the producer of this podcast series. And thanks to you for listening. If you would like to subscribe to the Leading Voices in Food podcast series, you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Transcripts are also available on the website of the World Food Policy Center. Thank you. I am Norbert Wilson.